I really feel uh, I want to talk to you, and this, this kind of dovetails a little bit from Sunday morning, maybe another, another kind of a path to the same thing. I feel like the Holy Ghost is talking to our church right now about some key things, about decisions and mindsets and so forth, and Hebrews 10 and 35 is where I want to begin tonight. I'm going to teach a Bible study, and again, we welcome you to Bible study class. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Our faith is what's going to operate this thing at the end. Don't lose your faith. Look at your neighbor and say, don't lose your faith. This isn't even a matter of losing it. This is about, he said, don't cast it away. You know, some, fee, some folks lose it. Some folks just give it away by choice. Don't do that. For if you, here's the thing. For you have need of, say it, patience. Yeah. <laughs> that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. By the way, some of us are standing demanding God to fulfill his promise when the reality is we haven't done his will yet. So be careful what you're demanding until you've done your part. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he won't tarry. Now the just, they're going to live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul hath no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back under perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of a soul. He said, my... If any man draw back, I, my soul has no pleasure in him. You know, I, I, you know sometimes we like to, we, we walk around sometimes so uh, tender uh, hearted and thin skinned and we want to blame every little thing that happens on some spiritual bump and some of us, some of you, I don't, <laughs> tend to live so close to the edge of faith that it's almost like you're just waiting for some decent excuse to go to hell. <laughs> because that's what's going to end up happening if you lose your walk with God. I got news for you. I love every one of you, but there ain't a one of you worth being lost over. I don't intend to lose my walk with God because somebody says something stupid to me or somebody does something stupid to me. Hello? Amen. Let's grow up. Man up a little bit. Stop being babies about everything. There is no really legitimate reason to ever backslide. Not when you understand truth. Well, glory. The theology of the will of God. That's what I want to talk about tonight. The theology of the will of God. How many of you want to be in the will of God? How many of you want to do the will of God? How many of you want to find the will of God? Amen. That's what I want to talk about. Lift up your voice. Lay down your Bible. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus, I feel authority in this house tonight. And Jesus, I step onto this platform in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I come to this pulpit in the name of Jesus, and I'm asking you to allow the authority and the anointing of my call in this office to flow in this house, in this place tonight, and help me to feed your people that which is needed to help them make it through in Jesus name everybody said amen you may be seated in the name of the Lord lay everything down and give the Lord a good hand clap offering of praise together if you would I want to talk a little bit of basic theology tonight and the truth of the matter is uh, at the end of the day, of all the hats that I wear, the predominant one is uh, pastor of this local church, senior pastor of this local church. And so I am predominantly responsible for the raising up and the feeding of this flock of God and basically trying to get as many of us to heaven as I can. And so in practical terms... I really don't have time to be a deep theologian, but I do obviously have to 
be at least a part-time theologian. But I liken it more to being a general practitioner. Okay? I've got to deal with so many things of a variety that sometimes I don't always get as the time to spend on a specialty as much as I was like to, meaning uh, a special area of study, for example, or something of that nature. And I don't have, unfortunately, the, the luxury of that because of all the variety. Now, look, bring up uh, Genesis 6 and let me show you why. Uh, most scholars agree that Noah's Ark was indeed a type of the New Testament church. And watch what the Bible says about that ark in verse 18. But with thee I will establish my covenant. Everybody say covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So God says to Noah, I will make a covenant with your family, but that's not all. And verse 19, of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall you bring into the ark, and keep them alive with thee, and you shall, they shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Everybody say, two of every sort. Now, it's my opinion that as a type and a metaphor goes, that the animals were a type of all of the different types of people that would come into the New Testament church. Noah's Ark was responsible for saving flesh. The New Testament church is not about saving flesh. We're about saving souls. That's why New Testament soul people can be martyred but yet we still have our soul saved because the New Testament church did its job. Uh, I think that the two of every sort is, is, a, is a type of the variety of humanity because the Bible said of the New Testament they would come from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Two of every sort. And I can tell you Nack certainly has got two of every sort. We got more than two of some sorts. <laughs> but when you start dealing with people, you start dealing with every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. The, again, the ark saved flesh, but the New Testament church saved souls. And every local church is going to deal with all kinds of sorts of people. All kinds of sorts of personalities. And, and, and you name it, and, and it's going to have it in the church. That's why when you encounter strange things at times in the church uh, and you think to yourself well uh, must not be the real church because uh, it has some this in it there's a little hypocrisy of this or that sort over there well again you you're not understanding the word of God every sort you're going to find in the house of God it's a type it's a metaphor and uh, so in the church and as a matter of fact I want to say multiracial multicultural uh, multi-personality types of people. You know, in other words, everything that God created uh, should be in the church. I don't believe a church should be all one race. It shouldn't be all one personality type. It shouldn't be all one of anything, for that matter. Uh, and it certainly should be a reflection of its community as much as possible. And so what makes the most exciting New Testament churches are churches that have every sort that are in them. So no matter where you came from tonight, no matter what your background, no matter what uh, mindsets and so forth, it doesn't matter. Everybody can be born again of water and of spirit and more importantly can become saved. The church can get you through just like Noah's Ark got you through the flood to the end. The church can get you through the mayhem of the end times uh, and get us to the trumpet. Can you say amen? <laughs> Let's give the Lord a hand clap offering of praise and thank him for the church. <laughs> Amen. Now, with that thought in mind, let me go back to theology for a minute because I want to talk to you about the will of God. Now, we, there's no way we could cover this exhaustively in one session, but I think we can at least get a good handle on it. 
Uh, but we need to have a basic understanding of how the will of God flows and, and folds and unfolds and so forth in order to keep us steady in our walk with God. If there's anything that hinders us, it is the constant roller coaster effect that so many people are on emotionally and, and with your faith. There are some people, you talk to them, and uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning, they seem fine. By 10.30, they're in a crisis. By 11.30, it all worked out. They have lunch, and they start it all over again. Now, the reality is, is oftentimes the drama never really warranted all of the emotions to start with. It was, it was, it's our own uh, instability and at times immaturity that creates these kind of things. And we have to settle that down. You cannot live on that kind of a roller coaster. And your faith wasn't designed to go up and down. It was designed to sustain you and sustain me. And so the point is, when it comes to the will of God and understanding how it interacts with the will of mankind, uh, uh, we have to understand there's two major forks in the road. Now, I just preached an entire message Sunday morning about this, talking about worldviews. Okay, and uh, so I don't need to go much deep into that other than to say if you are a believer, which I'm assuming obviously we are tonight here, then we need to develop a biblical worldview. If people are not believers, then um, they're not going to have a biblical worldview. Now, there are people you're going to encounter who believe in God who do not believe in the Bible. Okay, so just believing in God does not mean you have a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview means is that I have chosen to decide that this word of God, this Bible that I carry around, is the word of God, and it is the source of spiritual guidance and emotional answers and life answers that I need, and I'm going to endeavor to apply my life to that book. That's a worldview. Can you say amen? <laughs> now, you've heard me tell the story many times, and it needs to just be to remind you but years ago I talked with a man who was a businessman who had a uh, who was a landlord he happened to be and he was talking about he and I were talking about this issue and as a pastor he was telling me that he said you know he said you're wrong for teaching people that they should pay their tithe first to God I said okay why is that well he said you need to read A.H. Maslow's hierarchy of human needs and it says that housing and shelter is the number one need. And, uh, well, okay, you know, I believe that, that tithing and offering is the number one need and housing's next. <laughs> now, the question is, it's nothing to do with intelligence because he's a very intelligent man. The issue is worldview, okay? And so, in the discussion, you know, I, I pointed out and he's trying to argue me. He said, no. He said, shelter. I said, look, there's, he said, why would you believe? I said, there is no other reason other than the difference between me and you is I believe the Bible is the word of God. You don't. He even used to sell Bibles, which I thought was amusing in business. He sold them, but he didn't believe in them. He said, well, I believe in, I believe in the Bible. I said, no, you don't, because the Bible teaches that the tithe is holy. It belongs to God. He wants it first. He said, you know, he didn't tell nothing about the wigwams or the tents or anything else being before that. <laughs> I said, it, it's, this isn't rocket science. This is either you believe the word of God or you don't. It's either a worldview of yours or you don't. And not everybody that comes to church has a biblical worldview. Some of you have a baptism of the Holy Ghost, but you do not live with a biblical worldview. You have things about your life that are contrary to the Word of God. You know it and refuse to adjust it. Okay, So therefore, uh, it's not a biblical worldview. So my point is, bring up Leviticus 27, uh, verse 30, just as an example. The Lord said, all the tithe, everybody say all of it, mm -hmm. whether it's see the land, fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It's holy unto the Lord. Matter of fact, under the law, in this verse, and we just taught on this last summer, so we're not going to spend time on it, but if a man would redeem all of his tithe, he, he had to pay a fifth part. In other words, God was so convinced that the tithe belonged to him 
that if you used it for anything else, you had to pay him interest. <laughs> now, that's how convinced God was that it belonged to him. So even though my friend used to sell Bibles, he doesn't believe what it says. And again, you don't have to get fussed up with people. You don't have to argue with them. Don't try to spend all day on an issue, a side issue. Get to the main issue. Let's talk about how we view the Word of God. Can you say amen? <laughs> Because anytime you're dealing with another worldview, of course they're going to come with a different logic flow. They're going to have a different way of viewing life. That's just part of it. Now, what I want to talk about is I want to address some questions tonight from the perspective of a worldview that comes from a biblical perspective. For example, uh, we obviously believe there is a God, but here's a question. We, all, we, we believe that God has a will. But is God, or does God, I should say, ever change his mind? Can we change God's mind? Can we change God's will through our prayers or action or whatever? Does God know our future? Does he know what we're going to do and decide to do tomorrow? Does God know what your next move is in the chess game, so to speak? Does he know the end of this whole thing? Does he know whether I'm going to be saved or whether I'm going to be lost at the end of this? Does he already know? And if he does know, by the way, another legitimate question is, then why all of this production? If God already knows everything anyway, why do I have to go through the routine? Now, those that believe in, in predestination, that's, that's a little bit of their argument. They're saying, look, God already predestinated some to be saved and some to be lost, and so therefore it doesn't matter what you do. Okay? Man, that is a very depressing worldview. That's a depressing doctrine uh, because you know it's basically saying you were born to lose, or you were born to win, one or the other. And neither has anything to do with, with you. And uh, so that's not the view that, that I come from. But uh, the issue at heart here is what did God know and when did he know it? <laughs> and so whenever we're dealing with, with leaders, we like to ask that question. So the question is with God, how do you know? Now from a theological standpoint, this is something a little piece that I've actually taught before, but I want to remind you about it. There are two classical views when it comes to the theology of the will of God. One is called a classical view, and that simply means God knows uh, everything. He knows the end from the beginning. Uh, he's not held to any nexus of time. In other words, God is in 1854 right now, just like he's in 2013, and he's already in 2015, even though you and I are not there yet. Okay? That, because time, God is not relegated uh, to time. He's all-knowing. There's nothing hid from him. Now, another uh, view is called uh, an open view. Everybody say open. So it's classic or open, or some call it openness theology. Now that's a little different. What it says is that God knows all about the present, the past, and the future, and, uh, but the future is only partly known to him. Uh, it's not known yet because it didn't occur yet. Now if you, if you have that perspective, then you would also have to believe that God has no, um, he's not in the future. He's not really omnipresent. Uh, he's not moving in another time zone, that God is restricted to the same issues of time as you and I are. Uh, and basically, he's waiting on a response from us. So what will happen will depend on us, and God doesn't really know uh, any different. Now, between these views, the, the, the reality is I've come to the conclusion for myself that I'm kind of a mix uh, between the two. Uh, so I'm not sure, I may have to come up with a new name for my theology. <laughs> but basically, I believe, first of all, in the classic sense, I believe that God is, uh, I, I believe that God is everything that he said he is. I believe he's omni, uh, omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. Anybody agree with that? I believe he's omnipresent, that means he's everywhere. Anybody agree with that? <laughs> 
I believe he's omniscient. That also means all-knowing. Anybody believe in that? Now, if he's omniscient and all-knowing, it, it seems sensible to me that he does know the future. He does know. And any of you that have ever been used in the gifts of the Spirit and have had a dream or a vision or a word or something that God reveals to you and you see it unfold in the days to come, you know that the only way that would be possible is to, for God to be omniscient. Okay. Now, having said that, I also do not believe, though, I also believe in a little bit of openness in that I don't believe that just because God knows the future that he is mandated to it. I believe that things can change. In other words, God does, does have a will, but he does not always get his way. His will can change or evolve based on the interactions with human wills. Because God has given strength to human wills. We are free will creatures. Now, and I want you to know, you know, sometimes we say, well, God, just, you know, just have your way. Well, the, it would be wonderful if God did always get his way. But God doesn't get his way. The Bible says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is his will. But God's not going to get his way. Amen? Most of the world, actually, is going to be lost. And so God isn't anywhere close to getting his will, even though his will would be uh, to save everybody. He died on a cross to save everybody. But he's not going to get his way. And sometimes people don't feel that God has been fair to them or they get angry at God. Now usually it has to do with some unanswered prayer or usually it's in response to something that they perceive God did or if they uh, don't really necessarily believe God did it, but God allowed it. And so, therefore, since it's not fair, then that means God's not fair. And the whole thing just sort of collapses like dominoes from that point on. The problem is, you have what I call the mystery of history. And it's that nagging question that says, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, the flip question is, why does good things happen to bad people? <laughs> you know, why does any of it happen? And the mystery of history, uh, the mistake we make sometimes, is that we have to keep our eyes on the big picture in order to maintain a stability of faith. And what I mean is, uh, is that, look, we have to acknowledge when it comes to the will of God, you and I don't have usually enough knowledge to make a proper judgment about something especially if it has to do with time that transcends beyond us. The mystery of history is that I live my, whatever, 75 years, and, uh, and, and you know, at some point in the middle of my life, I, 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 I get angry because this happened or that happened or this wasn't fair or, or this or that, and we want to we wanna get angry at God and judge Him because of, of a snapshot of time. And we look back over the trial we've been in for the last three or four years and say, God, it's not right. This isn't, this isn't right. This is, this is wrong. This is not fair. You're not... You're not faithful, all I can tell you is, but you don't know enough yet to make that judgment. You can't judge something until it's finished. It's like being in the middle of a construction progress. You walk in, you look around and say, man, this place is a mess. This is stupid. This is out of order. Whoa, 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 whoa. Give it a few months. <laughs> Judge the house when it's done, not when it's in the middle of the foundation being laid. Don't judge the, the drywall before the paint's been applied. Don't, don't judge the thing until it's finished, and yet we do that with our life all the time. Things are still unfolding. Things are still happening. Bring up Revelation 21 on screen, and let me show you at the end. Everybody say the end. And God, let me show you what he's going to do at the end. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. 
neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat on the throne saith, Behold, I make all things new. Everybody say new. And he said unto me, Write these words, they're true and they're faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, which means the beginning and the end. You see, we understand that God was in the beginning, but we forget that he is also in the end. And we are not at the end yet. I will give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of the water of life freely, but it doesn't come until the end. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, sorcerers, the dollars, liars, etc., they'll all have their part in the lake of fire that burneth with brimstone, which is the second death. But wait a minute, I thought that it was his will that not anybody should perish. But that all should come to repentance. Yes, that is God's will. But, his, but God does not always get his will. Because his will sometimes becomes subordinate by choice uh, to our will. And when our will gets tangled up in things, we need to get a little careful about being overly judgmental toward God when sometimes we're walking through issues that have to do with our own will, our own drama, and an unfinished work that God has not completed in us yet. Payday hasn't come yet. We haven't received the end of this thing. When Jesus told the parable of the harvest, he said, I need labors. And in the 11th hour, he hired a slew of them at the, at the end. Uh, and and his, he didn't even have a contract. He just said, whatever's right, you shall receive it. What he was saying to those, he said, just trust me. Just, just go to work. You ain't doing anything anyhow. <laughs> the day's already been lost to you anyhow. Just get involved. Go, go do it. Go ahead and trust me. And as the story unfolded, they ended up getting paid the same thing as, as he paid everybody else. Not because they earned it, it was just because he's a just God. I'm here to tell you uh, there are some things that are going to unfold in you yet uh, that are not, they're not there yet. It's not time yet, uh, but God is just and he is faithful uh, and he is going to do the things that he said he's going to do as long as our will doesn't circumvent it somehow. Somebody ought to give God a hand clap praise. And somebody ought to lift their voice and begin to praise him right now. Come on and glorify him, church. I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. Don't you think for a minute God's going to let us down. He knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows everything about it. Paul confirmed it once when he said he was caught up into paradise. He said, I heard unspeakable things which are not lawful for me to utter. I can't even tell you what I saw. 2 Corinthians 2. Paul said, it's written, I hath not seen nor ear heard. It's not even entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. That wasn't theory to Paul. He was writing because he'd been caught up to the third heaven and he saw the things that he was not allowed to speak. Jesus himself said, In my Father's house there are many mansions. But he said it in the text. He said, I'll make all things new. I'll put away the crying. You're suffering with pain. You won't be suffering with pain forever. You're dealing with sorrow and crying and tears and issues. We're not going to weep forever. We're not going to cry forever. Uh, payday's coming, folks. God's going to make things right. Uh, and he said, I'm going to put the old things away. I'm going to put all things new. Uh, everything's going to be paid up. Everything's going to be settled uh, in the end. Uh, and therefore, we need to be careful trying to judge God before the end. You say, well... Uh, how can we wait? Because the just shall live by faith. And if you don't choose to believe God and take him for that by faith uh, and, and, and walk in faith, uh, you will not end up having the will of God unfold in your life because uh, we have 
superimposed our will on top of it. How can God do it? Well, because he said, I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. How many of you believe this morning, really? I mean this morning, <laughs> tonight. <laughs> How many of you believe truly in your heart that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth? Would you raise your hand? Hmm. Yeah, you're in a good... We're in a company of creationists tonight. <laughs> now, let me ask you a question. Why do you believe that? Loud. The Bible says so. Now that requires faith. Is there anybody here that was there? You know, God challenged Job when he was fussing up one day. God said, where were you when I was setting things in order? Where, where, where were you? Because again, what Job was doing is he got a little lippy. God said, where were you when I put it together? Now, my point is, is this. None of us were there in the beginning. Every one of us raised our hand and said, we believe because the Bible says. Okay, that's fair. I, through faith, we understand that the worlds were created. Okay, I believe that too. I agree with you 100%. My only point is that he didn't say he was just the beginning. He said he was also the end. He's Alpha and Omega. So, that means that if the, if the Bible tells me, if I believe he was in the beginning just because the book said it, then that means I have to, by faith, trust him that he's at the end just because the book said it too. If he's not at the end, he probably wasn't at the beginning either. And so, we're not losing anything by not, you know, if it turns out God doesn't exist. You know, we're not really losing anything. But I'll tell you one thing, the other worldview will sure cost, sure cost you. <laughs> but we have to understand the time factor. It's critical because how you view life or how you view time affects how we process tragedy and disappointment when it comes into our lives. We start asking, <clears throat> how does God know uh, does he have knowledge? Uh, how does God's knowledge relate to the flow of time? <clears throat> is he in time or is he just... In other words, if I get stricken with something tomorrow, the question is, did God know? Bring up uh, Isaiah 46, verse 9. Remember the former things of old. For I am God. Everybody say God. There is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring, <coughs> excuse me, the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. <coughs> Do you notice how he said, he said, I declared the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. Now this is why I believe that God is in all time. I believe God's already in 2015. I believe he already knows how everything is going to unfold. I believe he's also in 1854. I believe he was also in the beginning. I believe that God uh, is so powerful and so, uh, so awesome uh, that he declares the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. Uh, and my counsel, he said, shall stand uh, and I will do my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, <clears throat> excuse me, I have spoken it. Everybody say, God said. He said, I will also bring it to pass. I have, I have purposed it. I will also do it. Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted that are far from righteous. God was saying, uh, listen to me. I know what's coming. I know what's happening. I, I know everything from the end of the beginning. Uh, and you can't judge God from, from just observing a few years, give or take, uh, that you may have a somewhat even limited knowledge of what's going on around you. We simply must affirm he is God. 
and be able to live with it. Because sometimes <clears throat> that's the only thing you're going to be able to say. Isaiah 55, what's he say? He said, my thoughts, they're not your thoughts. <laughs> Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Listen, it is not a cop-out to say when you come to a point of confusion and you have to affirm he is God and I trust him. That's not a cop-out. People like to say, ah, oh, that's just a crutch. That's just a, 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 a cop out. No, no, it's not. By faith, uh, we understand. I acknowledge the reality. I acknowledge that I'm not as knowledgeable as God. <clears throat> and don't forget, faith has to be executed in order to please God. And God does not always expect to be understood but he does expect for us to trust him. Amen? You there? It's not a cop out to say, well, I don't know. I just, I just trust God. That's reality, my friend. God knows things I don't know. Matter of fact, Deuteronomy 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all of the words of his law. Yes, uh, once things are revealed to me, they become mine. But there are so many things that are not revealed to me yet. I don't understand them yet, uh, but I trust God that he understands it. It's it's It's... It's simple and yet powerfully succinct because he has not revealed everything to us. Even the Bible doesn't reveal everything to us. It has things, as I preach Sunday morning, portions of faith that have to be uh, added here and there. It's not a story about the, about the history of the heavens. Uh, it's a story about the, the, the history of mankind. And more specifically, <clears throat> how God the Creator interacted uh, with mankind. It, the Bible itself is not a, a, an unlimited source of knowledge. It is only a source of what God has chosen to reveal so far. One uh, biblical... Theologian J.I. Packer one time wrote this. He said, We must be aware of draining the mystery out of Scripture in a misplaced desire for rational consistency. We can frequently trace theological error and confusion to the, to the intruding of, of rationalistic uh, speculations. The passion for systematic consistency and the reluctance to recognize the existence of mystery and, and consequently subjecting the scripture to the demands of human logic. He, he's got an awesome point. He said, sometimes we are just so determined that the Bible is going to answer everything that, that, that we just, we, we'll just throw our own logic into the midst of it. And sometimes we make a mess. Hence... Mr. Packer said, I have learned to live with some incompleteness. I've learned to live with some paradox and incomprehensibility and the deep mystery in my relationship with God as I think it theologically. What he's saying is, I, I, you know, real deep way of saying it, he was basically saying what, what Brother Tenney says, the biggest room in your brain needs to be reserved for the things you don't understand. <laughs> Brother Tenney said it a whole lot easier than Packer. <laughs> but Packer was relating it from a theological standpoint. He said, you can't, listen, that's not being stupid. It's acknowledging that there are secrets that belong to God. I do not know what is going to unfold tomorrow. I do not know what I'm going to face tomorrow. I do not know everything that's going to unfold, and neither do you, but I do believe God knows. Somebody clap your hands unto the Lord and thank him. Because God's not confused. 
I realize that my logic and my reasoning is, is, has not been able to deliver everything to me. So 1 Corinthians, bring it up on screen. Chapter 1 says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Look, you see your calling, brother. Not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's chose the weak things to confound the things that are mighty, the base of the world and the things that are despised. Hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. Now here's the bottom line reason, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God is not going to allow flesh to become so puffed up that it's able to glory in his presence. So I'll share with you some MGB theology. All right? I, this, I can't really tell you that I can expound on it other than to say it comes from Scripture, it comes from experience, it comes from what I've learned and know so far, and it could change next year. But right now, my thinking on it is, is I do believe that God knows all things, but somehow he has chosen to still be able to interact with us as if he does not know. Now, he does know. But he's not acting like he knows. Now, before you think that's really weird, just consider any of you that have ever had children, you've done that. You ever played hide-and-go-seek with a kid that tried to hide behind a pole? <laughs> and just because the pole was wide enough to cover his eyes and he couldn't see you, he thought you couldn't see him. <laughs> Again, a classic example of why it's not wise to choose things on basic uh, limited understanding. <laughs> but there's times you've interacted with your children and you, you know, you knew what was going on. But you go ahead and you allow. And I, I tell you one of the classic times that it is. It's, it's those times when you have, you know your kid did wrong. You caught them. But they don't know it yet. And so you give them the opportunity, when you share this with them, you give them the opportunity for some mercy. And do they take it? Usually not. <laughs> oh, no, and they'll begin, them little cherubs will begin to lie to you out of their teeth. <laughs> lie to you. I didn't do that. I didn't. Now, are you sure? Is that your final answer? <laughs> Are you sure? Is that what you're going with here? Yeah, yeah, you know. Then the greater knowledge of the parent becomes superseded upon the will of the child, but it was based on the choice of the child. Now my point is, if we do that all the time as human beings, why is it so hard to consider that God doesn't react with us the same way because we, after all, are his children? And his knowledge of us is much greater than our knowledge of our own kids. I believe God knows all. I believe God will, God's will, even though he has a will for us, but it evolves or changes, whatever word you want to use, in relation to the actions of our human will. Knowing our future, in other words, does not necessarily mean that it is mandated. I do not accept the principle or the concept of predestination. I do not believe that it's already been determined whether I'm going to be lost or saved. I don't believe that. I don't believe that only 200,000 people are going to be saved in the end time. I don't, I don't believe, I believe all of that is error. It's contrary to, uh, really, it's contrary to logic, let alone theology. Matthew 11, real quick. Come unto me, on screen, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How can that be true if everybody was already predestined? John chapter 7, verse 37, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. John 3 and 14. 
as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, ever, or have eternal life. Excuse me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, everybody say whosoever, Believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Over and over, and I just picked out a few. God is saying that the opportunity of salvation is open, just like Moses uh, lifted up the pole and everybody that looked was healed. Uh, but I promise you, anyone that did not look was not healed. And anyone that does not receive New Testament salvation experience is not going to be saved even though God's will was for them to be saved. This was, this was God's will. To predestinate mean to be uh, ordained. God wanted it, but it's not his command. And sometimes when he gives us a word of prophecy or a promise, or this and that. God is not telling us what's absolutely going to happen. He is telling us and showing us what his will is, what he would like to see. But hear me, you and I have the ability to derail or postpone the promises of God in our life. God gives you a vision or a dream and speaks to you. You're going to be a great physician cool. I have been predestinated to be a doctor. Don't, don't bother me with all that schooling. God's chosen me. Hello? And so for the next several years, I just happily rejoice and go along my way thanking God. It's coming. It's on its way. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. My refusal to try to walk toward what God has shown me that his desires are can overrule God's desires. And therefore, my will can at times on some things even override the will of God. Now, let me show you again how powerful human will is Jesus had to, to consciously decide not my will but thine be done in order for the work of Calvary to be completed I'm telling you the man Christ Jesus had willpower and a will within him that had he chosen to stop the whole process and call, as the song says, 10,000 angels, uh, it would have shut down the plan of God. It, the will of man can override. Now, I tell you what would have happened since the overall will of God is to redeem mankind. Uh, God will work around whatever flesh falls short. And he will make another way. So if he doesn't use me, yeah, if I won't praise him, the rocks will cry out if they have to. There are certain things about the will of God that are prophetically staked, but my association with them is not necessarily prophetically staked. It'll either happen or not happen based on how I interact with God through the process. Skip down to 2 Peter 3. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing. Everybody say, not willing. Mm -hmm. That any should perish, but it all should come to repentance. But again, I want to remind you, he's not desirous that we be lost, but there, but most will. Because we have a will. And sometimes our stubbornness overrides. God's plans. 
Romans 8 and 28 says, For we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose, for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, uh, etc. Now, here's what I'm wanting you to say. He said, yes, all things work together for the good. By the way, it did not say that all things were good. He didn't say everything's going to be pleasant. He didn't say, you know, there is a, what we call a permissible will of God. And then there is a perfect will of God. Both of them are, are you know, I mean, the very fact that it is a permissible will of God. In other words, you, 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 you come to God and you say, well, uh, you know, there, there's a choice of three things that need to be done today. I'd like to do this. And, and God says, say, well, all right, I, I permit that. Go ahead. And go do, and that, that's okay. Nothing wrong with the permissive will of God. A lot of people function their lives in the permissive will of God. But there is a perfect will of God where you're not operating off of, you know, your priority desires that were permitted by God, but now you have yielded your will completely uh, to his choice. Now, that's the perfect will of God. Now, before you get to thinking that the perfect will of God is some luxurious place, that has no setbacks. And no, I, my experience has been, I think personally, that the perfect will of God will tend to have a rougher way to go. Because if you and I are in the perfect will of God, that means there are great things at stake. And that means the enemy's doing everything he can to prevent it. I told you a man of God prophesied to me years ago when we were on our way to come to Norfolk. He said, the prince of the city of Tidewater knows you're coming. He's identified you as God called and he dispatched demons all the way to Indiana where my troubles began on my way here. And, and he said, they're there to destroy your faith before you got here. I am here in the perfect will of God. But understand, I could have derailed it totally or even adjust it, delayed it. I can tinker with it because God allows me to have a will. Well, if God has chosen this to do that, then there shouldn't be any, any hassles. Well, I don't know. I, I really think actually the opposite is true. If God has chosen something, the enemy, the enemy identifies it. And he wants to do everything he can. But if you and I keep making the right responses and keep humble before God and keep that promise of God in our minds and stop judging him over every trial, but start giving God praise and glory and honor and start. I'm telling you, our will can help bring about the will of God. But sometimes our lips and our mouth can end up slowing down. Man. Kind of awkward in here. <laughs> Anybody have the Holy Ghost? <laughs> yeah, four of you. That's wonderful. <laughs> I feel God's. I, I, you know what I'm feeling in my spirit? I'm feeling like God's saying to the church, you know, I'm taking a lot of lip <laughs> from things that is not His doing. You remember I preached Sunday, they said, you will become witnesses to yourselves. <laughs> so am I. So my point is, is not everything that unfolds is always God's doing or not doing. There's a lot of different things. And so we got to be careful how cocky we get about, you know, I stumbled into a circumstance. I... I had an accident that set me back, or an illness, or, or a, a, a firing, or a layoff, or a, you know, name whatever. The issue, 
not, it's not right. I'm here to tell you. Sometimes you're correct. Sometimes it's not right. Not everything that happens to me is right. Not everything that happens to me is fair. Not everything that's happened to me because I'm a child of God has been positive. As a matter of fact, on some occasions, I've, I've even attracted some interesting f- enemy fire <laughs> simply because I'm trying to do a workout. So have you. But there is a difference between people who receive the struggles of this world and still acknowledge him as God and praise him as God, even though I don't understand. But I trust you, God, that as this thing unfolds, you said you will repay. You said you will set everything right. You said you will handle all of these issues, and I, I trust you with this. I feel the Holy Ghost. In Romans 8 and 29, he said, for, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed into the image of his Son. Now, here's the deal. This is the general desire of mankind. God is going to have a church. The New Testament church is prophetically staked. Nothing is going to stop the true New Testament church. That is not up for debate. It is not up for any question. There is no, I'm telling you, I don't care how many devils hate it. I don't care what the enemy is going to do. I don't care what the Antichrist has up his sleeve. I don't care. Nothing is going to stop the prophetic unfolding of God's New Testament church. Amen. But now whether or not I'm going to be in it, is not fully staked and unmovable. Because it's part of the things that are laid to my own will. God's will for our life is not set in stone. It evolves and reacts to how we react to it. And like a chess game, sometimes the next move is determined by the move that we make. And sometimes our choices and certain things we do kind of change God, crimp what he wants to accomplish. So sometimes God has to go from plan A that was his will, and sometimes he goes to plan B or C or D. Some of us are down to X, Y, Z. He's having to get into double digits. <laughs> Z1, Z2. <laughs> Sister Blankenship, would you come to the piano? I just, I just feel the Holy Ghost to say into the church, you know, God is, is, in his sovereign knowledge, has decided to make some of his actions contingent, contingent upon our faith upon our attitudes, upon our requests, upon our life choices. Not all, but some. Enough of his decisions has been laid and connected with us that it, we cannot just arbitrarily blame him when we get upset. He enters a genuine give-or-take relationship. Do I believe that we can change God's mind? Yes. Matter of fact, I believe sometimes we, as I've already showed, there's times people change God's mind just sheerly due to their actions. Genesis 6, 
Verse 6 says, it repented the Lord that he'd made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, fowls of the air. It repenteth me that I've made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Destruction wasn't what God wanted. It wasn't God's plan. It's not one. But the choices of men had so filled the earth with violence and so filled the earth with sin that God said, you know what? I, I'm having to change my mind. But then Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Moses was another character the Bible said found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, these men, we have direct biblical example, were able, able to change the thinking and the mind of God because God is not some ogre sitting out on the heavens that has you locked in some cage with no choices. No, no, not at all. God has set his will in motion for creation in general, at a general level, but he does not micromanage the creation. But God has chosen not to manage every detail of our lives because, now does he know what's going to happen next year? Yes. I believe he does. But he's not just going to arbitrarily say we're going to skip it all and get to what I know you're going to do anyhow. In other words, in other words, he leaves room for our wills and our choices. And you know, the, unrea the unfortunate reality is that people can and do often tell God no. But he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he st stays true to his nature. And he loves us. He said, the thoughts that I have to you, they're good. They're not evil. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to bring this about. But, but I need you to flow with me with the right spirit, the right heart, the right mind. So we need a theology of how we understand the will of God. And I believe even though God knows what's going to happen two years from now, if I, were, if I died two years from now, and whether I'm saved or lost. Now, I know what God's will is. It's, it's His will for me to be saved. But, but since my will is going to interact with it, does God know what's going to happen to me? Yes. But He gives me the right to deserve what unfolds. One thing I can tell you from experience is that when God when God decides that he wants to do something in somebody I believe that a human being that has a relationship with God can either delay the will of God or can accelerate the will of God again I don't have time to, to get into all of the examples but the book gives us examples of where God said I want to do thus and just and then he changes my said I'm going to do it quicker do it now. Stand with me together throughout this house tonight. You know what I want us to do? I want us to just lift our voice where we're standing. And uh, I want us just to begin to praise God with all of our heart. Would you do that? Dear Jesus, I loose this teaching tonight, the theology of the will of God. Lord, you're trying to work a will in us. God, there are things you're trying to accomplish in us. And Lord, we want your will. Forgive us. Forgive us for the times that our anger has gotten out of control. Forgive us for the times that, that, that we've snapped and allowed our emotions to say things that, that shouldn't be. God, forgive me for my words that at times have been stout against you. Let me love the work of God. Let me love the things of God. Let me love the church of God. Let me see this world through biblical eyes and not through my own logic.
and let me learn the power of being able to yield my will to you and say, not my will, but thine be done. In the name of Jesus. All over this house, I'm asking you to lift your voice. I want you to clap your hands unto the Lord, and I'm asking you to give God a praise and a shout and a victory. Jesus, we love you. Come on, praise Him with your voice as well as your hands. Hallelujah. We have a little bit of Bible that says clap your hands, but we have a lot of Bible that says shout unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Don't stop. Let's do that again. I have felt an anointing since I have walked into this house tonight. I'm telling you, God is moving. God is unfolding some things. He da la la ma da da ka Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, in the last 30 days, God has begun to move behind the scenes. Uh, some things have not matured enough yet to be announced yet, but hear me, God is moving. When God moves, I don't want to be caught off to the side with no oil and a heart full of attitude because I was busy stumping around on my own issues simply because I refuse to think and live biblically. God, I want your will to take place. Jesus, praise God. Give God a shout one last time, everybody. Hallelujah. Jesus' name. Amen, amen. We have a big weekend PI for those of you that are in classes. Those that could help us Saturday morning, we really need your help. And we appreciate that. should be done by noon. And Sunday morning, we're in church again. God bless you. You're dismissed tonight in the name of the Lord. You have children in our children's centers. Or